Whether you are a young teacher with an itch to teach overseas or a seasoned international teaching veteran, get out your paper and pen and be ready to take notes to write down what a solid CV looks like. In this first of a two-part series of episodes, we are fortunate to listen to international teaching consultant Jacqueline Millay live as she works with her client, Hannah Orman, to prepare Hannah's CV to launch her career as an international educator. Hannah stepped right up to volunteer for this recording, demonstrating her bravery and flexibility. Veterans know these are two crucial character strengths to being an international educator. It's a hyper-competitive recruiting world, so tune in and gain an edge by listening to this consultancy session. Learn how a simple and clear design to highlight specific types of information can move your CV to the yes pile for administrators reviewing your candidacy. Don't forget to listen to part two of this interview series in which Jacqueline reviews Hannah's cover letter. This bonus episode was recorded on January 18, 2023. We now give you Jacqueline and Hannah. Hi, Hannah, and welcome to Educators Going Global. One of our uh, first questions that we like to ask is, where are you in the world? Hey, well, thank you so much for having me. My name's Hannah, and I am a graduate student at the University of Georgia. So I'm currently living in Athens, Georgia, and doing my classes there. Very cool. So we often like to start with a short going global story from one of your experiences. Have you got one for us today? Absolutely. So my going global story is about my student teaching that I did back in fall of 2021. So I was in my last semester of undergraduate and my university has this partnership with a program called the Consortium for Overseas Student Teaching. So they will send students abroad and allow them to do their student teaching at an international school for their last semester. And when I heard of that, I absolutely had to do it. I'd always thought (laughs) about going abroad for my teaching just because I traveled a lot through high school and always thought it would be just an adventure to do with my life. So I applied to the program. And the cool thing about the Consortium for Overseas Student Teaching is that you have to commit to the program before they tell you what country you're going to. Uh. So I got accepted and I committed and then they told me I was going to Greece. So I got to spend several months in Greece and I just packed up, moved there alone. You don't go with anybody else from your university. Oh my goodness. And I taught third grade at an international school there. And it was incredible. I loved the students I was with. My mentor teacher was amazing. We became good friends and I just learned a lot. I was really thrown into the deep end as far as moving to a new country for the first time, but I loved it. And I loved the adventure and grew a lot just in confidence in myself as a teacher and definitely caught the bug for international teaching. So want to go back. That's the dream. That's so cool. That is so cool. And we have someone else here with us. We have a consultant in the house, Jacqueline Malay. Hey, Jacqueline. Hello. That was such a great story, Hannah. I loved hearing a little bit more of the details that I didn't know about. So, We're going to do a very different show today, and I think it's going to be a great help to folks who are thinking about hiring a consultant, a coach, to get them ready to recruit. So with that said, our guiding question is, what is a consultancy session for an international teaching candidate? Yeah, so the format is going to be where Jacqueline is going to go through Hannah's resume, which she's already received and had a chance to look at. She's going to spin her magic with Hannah along for the ride. And Hannah is going to be able to ask questions as they go along. And then after that, then we'll check in with Hannah to see how it went. And David and I are going to 
perhaps comment a little bit on specific things that we noticed that we thought were interesting about the consultation. So Jacqueline, over to you. All right. So Hannah, normally I would share my screen, but I've already shared the documents with you. So if you don't mind, if you can open up your CV and then the CV that I shared with you. So I have your CV that you shared with me on a separate window, but we're going to take a look at why did I completely recreate your CV? Yes. It looks very different. (laughs) It does. I'm sure it was a little bit of a shock. Like, wow, my name is huge. (laughs) So yeah, there's a few things that With an international CV, very often we're including photos, but I do know that there's a trend now starting that they're saying we don't need to put a photo, but I'm still of the belief that it sells a candidate because it makes them friendly, you know, and everyone is easily Googleable these days. So it just puts some of the mystery behind who am I talking to out of the way. And I use color blocks. So I use some color blocks on your CV to have the different categories stand out. And that first big block at the top is all about sort of your personal information, which may seem very shocking to you, like, whoa, why am I putting my date of birth, my nationality, my marital status? But these all come down to work visa issues, you know, so a school and an HR department looking at your CV overseas wants to know can they hire you? And then who do you have accompanying you? So that's why many times we include this information at the very top. It's also where you put all your contact information. So anything that I've highlighted in yellow is kind of like what I call your homework. It's something that you'll want to update. You'll be taking this CV uh, from the Google Doc and making a copy into your own document so you own it. So then the date of birth obviously needs updating. I don't know if you have LinkedIn. Are you, I didn't see you on LinkedIn. I don't have one. I probably need to start one. That's one thing that I've heard mixed reviews as far as educators, if you need one or if you don't need one as a teacher, do you recommend probably creating one? Exactly. I would recommend creating one, especially now because you're at the beginning of your career, especially international career. I think it's a great way to keep track and keep contact with all the people you're going to get to meet, you know, so you'll have colleagues on LinkedIn, you'll have supervisors, you'll have former heads of school on LinkedIn. And then as you do PD, you know, as you do some professional development overseas, you can add those people as well into your LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is not as personal as Facebook. It's the professional social networking site is how they're sort of touted as LinkedIn. So you can feel free to add anybody and everybody in your circle. And the bigger you grow your network, the more you have opportunities in the future to reach out to somebody and say, hey, I I see that you're working at this school. Do you happen to have any openings So, you know, the ability down the road to um, network is huge. So I would recommend creating a profile until then, until you've done that, then we can just keep this off of your CV. Okay. But I wanted to sort of park that there. You know, the little icon for LinkedIn is kind of cool. And then the profile link is the link to your profile rather than putting a big URL you know, when you put a big URL on a CV, it kind of looks a little a little strange. So that's yes. why I link it. So your hometown is really important to put the place where you would be returning in the summer because schools that most schools will pay for your flight. They'll pay for your flight from point of uh, where your hometown is listed to return to your hometown in two years after your contract. And some schools, if you do continue to sign with them, you have a third year, a fourth year, so on with a school, they may also supply that summer ticket home and every time it's back to this hometown. So my recommendation to clients is never put like the closest airport, but actually put your hometown because they might fly you to the closest airport to that hometown as opposed to, you know, like if you said Atlanta, Georgia, then you know, from the point of Atlanta to your hometown, you're on your own. Whereas if you put this smaller town, I believe a smaller town that you've put in Georgia, that's going to be where they they get you home. 
The marital status is, so I put typically single or married. I don't think a lot of clients want, you know, divorced or widowed or, or some more personal information, but they, they could if they wanted. I basically just go with that toggle, single or married. And then dependents, they want to know uh, if they're school age children, especially. So you would have either no dependents or one or two or three dependents and then put ages in brackets. So I have made an assumption, but if this is different, we can change that. And then after the marital status, I like a balanced two column system. So because we have your LinkedIn profile, then my question is, do you have a website? Do you have Skype? Do you have something else that you want to share in your sort of personal information? And we can kind of balance that. Otherwise, we can just also delete it. But I don't know if you have some kind of a website or e-portfolio. I do not. Okay, and that's trying fine. to think that's... of something that we could fill in there, but I don't. Think yeah, that's... we could sign you up for Skype. You know, that's easy enough, and then it just gives people another option to be able to, rather than Zoom you, Skype you. But really, that's a little bit outdated. So we could also just completely eliminate it. Okay. Eventually, eventually, what you may want to do is gather evidence. What I was talking about, like an e-portfolio, could be just a Google Class site some teachers use or sign up for a free website like with Wix.com and then start to keep track of photos, certificates. I, I've seen some really great websites from teachers, like the, all the PD certificates you'd never know what to do with, scan them and then put them in under PD and then you always have them there for the future reference. So that could be something that you want to think about starting, but it can be overwhelming at first. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend it right now, but something down the road. And then we do have a little photo of you. I've cropped it so that it's just essentially your face and hair. Now, something I did notice was that you're not wearing any kind of a suit or a blouse. And I might recommend that you would change that to a more professional photo. It's a very cute photo, but in some countries you wouldn't be able to show your shoulders. And so that's why I did try and crop out as much as I could because you're wearing something else that was a very nice top, but just not a professional look. So that's something I would recommend to our listeners is the CV photo, if you're going to include it, should look like you in a job interview situation with a background that is not too busy either. This one is okay. It's got trees in the background, but it's more or less one color. You don't want a super busy background. And then I have your uh, headline. So I put a headline after all the information, the personal information, and it's kind of like a one-stop shop for HR departments or heads of school that are looking at your CV. You know, who are you? What are you? And so we mentioned here that your, I just realized, so you said three plus years, kindergarten to grade five. So I was going to say elementary, but I guess that's kind of obvious with K to grade five, substitute in student teaching. Now, this yellow, I wanted to know, did you have IBPYP experience in Greece? Yes, that's what they use there. Perfect. That's what I thought. And then I think you've been using Common Core in Georgia. Yes. Okay. So then we can unhighlight this, and that's accurate then. So IBPYP in Common Core. And then, so what I do is I look through your CV to see what makes you stand out, and immediately what stood out for me with your candidacy is that you have four years of working with children as a mentor and a tutor outside of your student and substitute teaching. So I think that's really important to highlight that when they start looking at your candidacy, they see, in fact, you have seven years of working with children. And then the other line, so I usually use a three-line headline, is again, what jumped out to me is that you're an enthusiastic community volunteer and leader. When you read this little headline, do you feel like that talks about you specifically? I think it does. I think that sounds like me <laughs> for sure. Great. Great. Okay. And I mean, as things, as you evolve as a teacher, of course, these things will change. So some examples in, for some of my other clients are enthusiastic school community participant and leader. So these, because when you move overseas, you often are part of the school community in and outside of the classroom. And so some of my clients do a lot with the school community 
you know, organizing sports or organizing festivals or activities for the school community. So that would be something I would put or, you know, as you're doing professional development and you start to get hooked on workshops and learning, you can say something like enthusiastic, lifelong learner, professional learner, you know, something like that. So these headlines will change with you as you grow in your craft. And then this next little part between the color blocks, I like to insert what you sound like. So I took this directly from your cover letter that you had sent me and I italicize it so that it does look like speech, like someone speaking. And then what I do is I bold the keywords. So do you mind if I read this out loud? Not at all. Go for it. Okay. So this is what you had written. And I also wordsmith it. So you might see uh, some new parts of it, but this is what uh, your voice sounded like in your cover letter. I love working with children and creating engaging lessons for students from diverse cultures. I believe in forging strong relationships with my students by getting to know them on a personal level and adapting my instruction to meet their individual needs. So I think what the strengths in having this kind of little blurb in your CV is, first of all, the head of school who's reading this gets to know you personally a little bit more about your teaching philosophy, but in a very short and succinct way without having to read an entire page of, you know, what you believe is important in a classroom. And then having highlighted the key words, they can also start to match these key words with what their philosophies are. So if they think it's important, obviously, to have engaging lessons and strong relationships and working with diverse cultures, they'll see these words highlighted in your CV and realize, oh, this is somebody that's on the same page as us. So then we scroll down, we see our next color block, and I immediately put education at the top. I know that some CV makers or samples will put your work experience first, but because you're working overseas and uh, the importance of getting a work visa, it's really important to put, can you get a work visa based on your education? So I, that's why I put education right at the top. And so we have your graduating date of May 2023 for your master's, your teaching certificate that is a T5. I did look that up and I think it's important to include it. I wasn't sure what that meant, but now I do. And I think it's important to include it. And then that you have a certificate in gifted education. Now, I wasn't sure the title of your certificate. Is it gifted in-field endorsement or how can we phrase that? Yes, I just typed gifted in-field endorsement because that's what it's titled, like the official title of the certificate I'm working towards. Okay. So so then what we can do is just put a dash. So certificate okay, and then a dash gifted in field endorsement. Fantastic. And then, yeah, so it's very important to highlight that you have a teaching certificate already and that you're getting one in May and that it's from the state of Georgia. Because Georgia is also a country and it could be confusing, that's why I put state of Georgia as opposed to Georgia state. Great. <laughs> and then put USA as well, because you want to make it clear that this is an American teaching certificate. And then Bachelor of Science in Elementary Education, we put honors program. And so all of that information is there for, as I say, HR departments and heads of school to see right away, oh, we could get her a visa, no problem, because she has an American teaching certificate and she has a master's. And it helps them also place you in the salary grid. So all this information right at the top of your CV is super important. And then when I was looking at your CV, I found it interesting. You put student teaching first and then you put teaching experience second. But what I did was I flipped that because okay. your teaching experience actually is right now. It's the most present and it's also what you're getting paid for. So it's important to highlight that someone out there has hired you and you're working, you know, so you put the teaching experience at the top. I do like to put dates first. I know that some people put dates at the end. I noticed you also had dates. I just find it's an easy way to sort of introduce what you're doing. And as you grow in your career, you'll be eliminating some things and then you'll be just putting everything that's most recent at the top. So I find it's important to use your title 
So what you did or what you are doing. So presently you're a K to five substitute teacher. And I make that the biggest and the boldest so that if someone is just scanning your CV, they see the titles of what you're doing is the biggest. And then where you're doing it is not as important. The dates are important, but they're not going to be as big. They're not going to be bolded or anything like that. And then common core standards underneath your title so that that kind of like it's a little snapshot of, oh, okay, so she's worked with Common Core. Oh, she's worked with IBPYP. Some people have IGCSE or A-levels, which is British. Some have Canadian curriculum. Some have Australian curriculum. So all those standards or curriculum you want to put somewhere on your CV for every job that you've worked with because it shows what you have made your lessons with and what standards you've used. Now, I did eliminate your bullet points because I found that it wasn't necessary to say something like, you know, teaching and planning lessons, because that is typically what a teacher does. So, okay. and a substitute teacher will also plan lessons. And, but what I did like about the third one, the grade five substitute teacher, is that you spoke specifically to, you taught grade five math, science, and social studies. So I thought that was important to highlight and keep in a bullet point. And that you were collaborating with coworkers and planning lessons. I thought that was also a relevant bullet point. So then we scroll down to your student teaching experience. And I wasn't sure if in Greece, did you do a grade three? Yes, it was student third okay. grade. It was grade three. Okay. So you always want to specify, as opposed to saying something like elementary student teacher or elementary teacher, if you have a specific grade level, I always recommend to my clients to put the specific grade level. And, you know, in some cases, it might be your whole CV might have a, a wide variety, or it might be each time it's the same grade, but it's always important to state what it is. And so you have IBPYP written underneath, you've got, I capitalized Greece to sort of have it stand out, because this is important, especially for international schools looking to see, do you have international experience? They'll see, oh, Greece pops right out like that. I try and avoid using acronyms. So TDL took me a little bit to find. I think that meant transdisciplinary. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I put it in brackets, but I always explain what the acronyms are. If they're not something like EAL or ELA, which are two completely different acronyms, but very common. So I think a lot of people know what those are, but TDL was something I wasn't familiar with until I saw transdisciplinary, then I was familiar with the term. And yeah, engaging with international school community, responding to cultural diversity of students was a great bullet point. So I kept some of those in there. The grade five student teaching was common core, correct? Yes. Okay. And then this is where I just added some things. So I want to check with you. So you planned and taught lessons in, I wanted to know, was ELA, math, science, something like that? Yes. So I did ELA for the first semester and then math, science, and social studies for the second. So I did get experience in all of the subjects. Okay. So we'll add and social studies. And because I'm now going off I will create a third bullet point. So facilitating small group activities is now going to be a third bullet point because we have the space at the bottom of the page one. Speaking of which, a two-page CV is very common and I would not recommend a one-page CV. I think you can't elicit all the experience and education that someone has in our profession in one page. And I don't think it's necessary to squeeze it all on one page. So I do recommend a full two page CV. So that's why we have some space at the bottom. Now you mentioned that you participated in PD sessions. So I added such as X and Y, cause I thought if you can remember some of the titles or what you did PD in, that would be helpful for somebody looking at your CV. Okay. Yes. Kind of I the spot. did mm-hmm. the PD lessons. I just sat in with them. Mm-hmm. As the student teacher, I know we did some in using the iReady technology was a big one. And then we also did some about 
using formative assessments throughout teaching, but I don't think that that one was a specific title. Okay, but that's actually, was it I Ready Technology? Anyhow, I'll yes. let you work. And did you just say formative assessments? Yes. Yeah, I think that's interesting to add Great. because it speaks to the fact that you took some PD on it. Okay. So I think that's good to put there. Wonderful. So then the following, we're on page two now. And so I'm just unhighlighting common core standards each time I think that is correct. Right? With Yes. Yeah, your student teaching. Okay. So the bullet points are, I would say, between two and three maximum per job or per internship as, as you have here for student teaching. And then as your CV grows, you're actually going to start eliminating the ones that are least relevant or the ones that are the oldest. So right now, because we have space, eventually, as because your CV will grow with you, you might need to eliminate some of the bullet points just to let you know. So then after your vast student teaching experience, which I thought was really interesting, and I'm sure that someone interviewing you in the future will want to hear more about the fact that you did kindergarten and grade three and grade five, like, you know, you've got a nice range, but then the next category is other related work experience. So on your CV, you had a number of jobs and I eliminated anything that I felt wasn't necessarily related to teaching, but the ones that I've put here. So the wealth management intern I've put because you were collaborating with team members and organizing client information. So that was the bullet point I kept okay. because that shows the ability to work with others and to be organized. And I think both of those things are really helpful for teachers. So I left that on, but as you grow in this career, you might need to eliminate that just for space, but also because it is just a couple months. The K to five camp counselor is excellent and three months in the summertime. And I loved your bullet points talking about the young girls. So caring for them and leading activities and designing. I put that word designing and teaching wacky science and handicraft classes. So, you know, it speaks to your responsibilities. And that's the thing with bullet points is you want to speak to what did you do? What did you accomplish and anything sort of innovative? And so I think designing wacky science sounds really cool. And then somebody, a head of school or a principal looking at your CV might have a science club and say, well, you know, Hannah would be great for a science club. She's had experience with wacky science classes. So Great. And then, so this next block is very unique to your CV. The community involvement was very detailed in your CV, and I found it pertinent also to your CV. But just knowing that as you add professional development as a category, and then you start going to workshops or conferences or even leading some workshops and presentations then I would say that this community involvement will get smaller and you will add a category called professional development. But right now, because you don't have that, then I was able to, you know, sort of dedicate almost half a page of your second page. But it was great because it shows your passion for giving of your time to your community, which is very important as an international teacher as well. So I just went ahead and guessed at the name of the town, but you can go ahead and fix that on your own because you just want to explain where it was each time. And again, your titles of what you were, lead teacher, volunteer, small group leader, those are the big and bold. And then a couple of the uh, bullet points for each one to explain not only what you got out of the experience, but also what you were able to bring to the experience. And then the last one, so I just guessed, you know, and I'm just giving you all kinds of options for interests. So the importance of having a well-rounded CV is also you're not just a professional, but you're also a human being, a person who has interests outside of school and the classroom and heads of school principals, they want to know who they're going to be working with. And so I've put a number of them here and highlighted them in yellow so that you can go back and put in your own. But something active, if you have, you know, a sport interest like volleyball, swimming, hiking, as I wrote here, or yoga, 
if you have something creative like painting or playing guitar or singing in a choir, if you have something a little bit more cerebral, you know, um, astronomy, astrology, I've seen, I've seen uh, meditation, reading, but I would be more specific with reading, like reading historical biographies or reading science fiction. You know, you want to talk to who you are outside the classroom. And sometimes these things will lead to clubs that they might have at their school and they need somebody to help run. You know, if you're interested in cooking and they have a cooking club, then they kind of see like, oh, geez, you know, that person's leaving and she is the cooking club head. And now this person is coming in and maybe they'll take over. So that's what I would recommend. Can you think, I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you think of some things that you might put there? Yes, I play tennis. I play piano. I love to bake. So that could be fun. And also hiking is definitely a passion of mine. So even just those four, and I'm sure That's I could perfect. think of others to add. Yeah, exactly. And so as you start listing them, you start to realize, oh, wait, but I also like to do this or I've done this in the past. And so that's the fun part is that you round yourself out as a a candidate with your interests. But it is just one line. I don't necessarily recommend bullet points or anything like that because it will take up a lot of space. Okay. And then the final thing is your references. So you'll notice I put it in a format and they're ready to sort of plug in the name of the person. And if the name is difficult to tell the gender, you might want to put Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. so that the person receiving this CV knows who they're going to be talking to. So, you know, some of the names, if they're foreign especially, might be difficult to know if it's a Mr. or Ms., but also names that are good for any gender might also be, you know, easier to put Mr. and Ms. in front. And then the title of that reference. So elementary principal or elementary assistant principal, uh, deputy head, head of school, what their title is, and then where they are teaching or where they are working, I should say. And so the elementary school, or um, here I put Gwinnett or Clark County School District. But if you have a specific place, that is where you put it. And then you want to get their professional email address and then a phone number. Now the phone number overseas very often will be, might be their cell phone, but it might also be their office phone. And one or the other is fine. When we're talking about principals in the US or admin in the US, usually that's going to be an office or a school phone number. So that's fine. And then I did put Thessaloniki, uh, Greece as a third reference. And if the person that you worked with directly it has moved on, and that is sometimes the case in international schools, then I would continue to put their name, their elementary principal, but you put former written in front. So former elementary principal, you put the name of the school, and then italicize the next one, now at, and then you put the name of the school. So for example, if your elementary principal happens to know you, hopefully they did know you, and at uh, Pinewood American School, then But let's say they've moved to another school in China or something like that. Then you would say now at, you know, Shanghai American School in China. And then that way the email is linked to the Chinese school as opposed to the Greek school. And it explains why do they have a Chinese email and a Chinese phone number. But you want to explain all of that in references like that. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. And that was a question I had. So thank you for explaining that. Okay, so that is your CV. Thoughts, questions before we take a look at your cover letter. Well, thank you for doing this. It really looks great. I like how it's much more personal than my other one. The other one was very black and white, hard to see anything about me through it. But this one, I think, does a great job of portraying who I actually am as a teacher, not just what I've done. And I like how you talked about how it's fluid and this will continue to shift and it makes sense to me how I would be able to do that and move stuff around as I gain more experience. Yeah, I mean, the the CV should grow with you. And so then uh, some of the experiences, some of the community uh, experiences might drop off because they become, you know, seven, eight years ago. So then to make room for 
you know, your, your new international school career, then you want to highlight that at the top and then slowly things drop off and it's, it's kind of fun. It, it can grow with you. So I'm going to turn this over to Audrey and David at this point. I become the fly on the wall and they'll ask you what you thought of the process and if you found this helpful at all. Yes. And for me, our two big words are framework and nuance. A lot of nuance coming through, especially in this cover letter. So again, thank you, Hannah. You're very brave to come on and have all this sharing come at you. Uh, I'm wondering, how are you feeling right now? What's some feedback you'd like to share? I'm feeling excited. I feel a lot more confident in these documents now, which is exciting thinking about applying places because I definitely felt like my CV and cover letter weren't quite as professional as they could be. And these flow a lot better and they simultaneously seem more professional, but also much more personalized, which is a great combination. So thank you so much, Jacqueline, for how you were able to pull out both of those things at the same time. I don't think I could have done that on my own. And yeah, I'm excited to go in and tweak these things, do my homework, do my edits, and have these ready to go. Something I do want to mention is you are ready to apply. So if you are willing and wanting to head overseas this coming summer, these documents are definitely ready to go. And because May 2023 is your graduation date for many of the items, the the master's and your final teaching certificate, those will be done by the time you head overseas. And so I'm excited to tell you that I just recently was working with a client who's in her second year of teaching. So she's just completing her second year and she's already been hired overseas to go to Cambodia. So I'm super excited for almost a brand new teacher to have found a job overseas. And I want to encourage you to start looking. We'll talk about next steps next as well. But I think if you're willing to go overseas, you are ready to go overseas and schools will be lucky to have you. Okay. That is encouraging (laughs) to hear. I think one of my big concerns was just the likelihood of getting hired at an international school as somebody who doesn't have any full-time, full-year experience as a teacher yet, and if it would be better to get a couple years completed stateside before looking into that, and just if you all had any thoughts on which is the better or way to approach that. Well, for sure, it's ideal. An ideal situation would be to have a couple years under your belt before you head overseas, but if your passion is heading straight overseas. That's what I did. Right out of university, I went overseas and I started teaching in Korea. And then I started applying for international schools for positions that were in, you know, one of these K to 12 schools, as opposed to like a language center in Korea. And when they looked at my CV, they said, well, you don't have any experience teaching in your own country. So go home and then come back. So I had to do that kind of in reverse. But if you're willing and ready to jump into it, I would say, go for it and see what comes of it. And don't be disappointed if it doesn't happen because you can rely on your backup plan, which is to stay, remain in Georgia and and get the stateside experience. Great, thank you. Yeah, I would echo that. I think that if schools are looking for a couple of years of experience, you can get those couple of years experience teaching overseas and it might not be a top tier school, but you know, if you're excited to get going, that's just as good a way to build up your CV as teaching in the States. So up to you how you're feeling. So I want to thank you both for the trip down memory lane. I was thinking back to my early CVs and, you know, trying to think about all the possible teaching related experience that I could come up with. So that was really fun. One of the additions that I liked about what you were talking about was the idea of the color blocks and how that really will highlight different sections of the CV. Did you come up with that idea just through time, Jacqueline, or did you see that somewhere? I actually stole that from a friend of mine. So a friend 
teaching in Korea at the time said, you know, I would recommend color blocks to divide up these sections. And so my CV has entire color blocks where the section is also in color. But then I found that it can start to say, you know, you're the green CV or you're the pink CV. (laughs) So Mm. then to sort of come away from that, I've come with just color blocks for the categories. And then the actual script is black and white. Or actually in Hannah's case, I used a dark gray. I just find it softer on the eyes. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, Hannah, I'm going to chime in about whether you should be looking to go overseas or not. And with so many things, that's not a binary choice. There is a middle ground. And I think you're hearing that from all of us. I just went through this with my son. He's a physics teacher his second year. And I spoke to a couple of administrators at my last school and I said, what's their advice for my son, Max, to become an international teacher? And they both said, have him do two years in a pretty good school, big public school. And he will learn a lot about onboarding. He'll get mentoring. He'll get a lot of experience. And then one of the search associates said the same thing. But on the other hand, what I can see you doing is recruit, go through the process, learn as you go, and you can always say no, because you've got a great coach at your side who's going to be able to give you a lot of insight. And maybe you find that mid-tier school that's small and they've it's a very nurturing place, and they've, they've got a great framework to support you. So I'll, I'll add that to your thinking. All right. Well, I had a specific question regarding putting the education information at the top of the CV. I totally get that in this case. So Jacqueline, when you're dealing with old timers like me, who have worked in a lot of schools, does the education still need to go at the top, or does something else go at the top? Yeah, I've always put education first for two points. It's to see, can you get a work visa? Because a lot of times the work visa is connected to your specific degree. You know, some countries will say, if you don't have a bachelor degree in what you're teaching, you cannot get a work visa. So they need to know that right off the bat. So if they have a bachelor in international relations and you're trying to be a math teacher, you're not going to get that job at that country because you don't have the background, the the educational background. And the second thing, it helps place you on a salary grid. You know, a lot of these good schools have very transparent salary grids and you have the bachelor's and then the next category is master's. You might have a second master's category and then you might have a PhD category and you move up in increments according to your education. So this also helps place you on the salary grid. So that's why I put it right at the top because they want to know. So for example, with Hannah, she has, she'll have a master's. So she's already one higher, one category higher than a bachelor's teacher. But then years of experience is part of that as well. So that salary grid, it's sort of the X, Y axis. And if they have a certain budget and you know, they have a candidate with a PhD and they have a candidate with a bachelor's and similar experiences and similar, they might go with the cheaper teacher because of the budget constraints. But the other thing also happens where if they want somebody with experience and with a lot of knowledge, they might go with the PhD and then looking at moving them into admin positions later. So that's why I always put that at the top because it's for both work visa and salary. And I would add another little piece that may or may not be a thing. And you've looked at many resumes as part of your, you know, when you were on the hiring side of things, Jacqueline, but it feels like logistically it kind of makes sense too, because your education segues into your experience in a way. So, you know, just for what that's worth, it makes sense in that way for me. About LinkedIn, you mentioned about the advantages of Hannah creating a LinkedIn profile And totally agree. I would also add to that, that there is a lot of potential on LinkedIn, Hannah. You can search. If you go up to the top and you put in international school, a bunch of schools will come up. And then you can go to those schools and see who the people are. And you can maybe even, you know, as Jacqueline said, you can 
it's it's a thing now to kind of cold call email these people and you can use some kind of in you might have such as oh this is cool you're the tennis coach i love tennis too blah blah blah, blah. or you can talk about oh my gosh you went to the same university as me you know or i've been in greece and things like that that it's now considered totally okay practice to reach out to people as Jacqueline said, and I would add that you can find out more of this kind of information. So definitely LinkedIn is a fabulous resource for looking for a job. Yeah, just this morning, I was looking at my LinkedIn, as I usually do. And one of my colleagues, former colleagues, and now principal at a school in Columbia had advertised that he had a couple of elementary positions. So I reached out to him and said, I have clients that are elementary teachers. What specifically are you looking for? And lo and behold, he's ready to get all their CVs, you know? So I told them these are vetted, already vetted candidates that I've approved and taken on as clients. And he knows me and trusts me. And he said, let me see all of the CVs that you've got. So LinkedIn can really help you with your job search as well as build your professional network. Absolutely. I want to put a pitch in here for whether it's a portfolio or a blog or some mechanism for a young teacher like you, Hannah, to document your personal and professional growth and whether portfolios are going to be used in recruiting or not, we don't know going down the road, but it's a really good place to put down your skill set and then examples of work that you are accomplishing. And then later when you're working on your CV and pruning your CV and it's growing with you, I love that terminology, Jacqueline. It's like a plant, just it's growing and you've got to prune some of it away as, as you add new schools on, but just find a mechanism where you are documenting how you're growing, the things that you're doing, and then that will help you in your communication in the future in your recruiting efforts. Yeah, and I also wanted to add that, first of all, I think it's really impressive, Hannah, how much teaching-related experience you have already, and I think you could very easily make a portfolio if you wanted to, no pressure, (laughs) but you might want to consider maybe adding in some things for your CV and your portfolio of if you could find a way to do some coaching or, you know, help out with clubs or student council or things like that at schools. Because as Jacqueline said, a lot of these schools are looking for what can you do beyond the classroom. So that might be some ways to build your teaching related experience. Again, I just want to underline that I think you've really got a lot of teacher related experience already. So good job. As Jacqueline said, I agree that I think you're a very strong candidate as someone who's just coming out of her master's. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's very encouraging to hear all of those things. And something that I didn't sort of highlight as well, Hannah, but there are Christian international schools out there. And because of your strong Christian background, that's something that you can highlight, move into your headline. And, and when you're applying, if you're specifically applying to Christian international schools, because there is a niche and there are quite a few of them all around the world, not necessarily in just a few countries, but all around the world. It's not every teacher that has that background that works at a Christian school. So you would be at an advantage. That would be a selling point for you. I want to bring in something, Jacqueline, you said in a previous podcast the whole idea when someone's looking at your CV and you want to give them every reason to put it into the yes stack and not the no stack and your explanation about credentialing that you're putting out in that CV and I'm licensed, I'm a U.S. citizen, I have experience in PYP. I just think that's so huge that for someone without much experience that they don't have that bolded smack dab right there at the top of their CV. And so I really appreciated that advice. Yeah, it's really interesting. The whole issue of work visas is not common at all when Hannah's applying for a job in the state of Georgia. You know, she doesn't have to worry, like, can I uh, legally work in this state? You know, but when you move overseas, that's the immediate thought of, 
the HR departments and the heads of school, unfortunately, they cannot hire every single nationality. It hasn't come to that yet. There are still certain nationalities because of maybe language barriers or because of education, they're not going to be readily accepted as an American, Canadian, or many of these quote unquote Western nationalities. And then the other thing is the trailing spouse or the family. Um, sometimes schools will not have the ability to educate the children that are coming with the teachers. And so they need to know that as well for the ability to get a work visa. So it's something that is very unique to our positions on the international circuit and something that maybe teachers from the States and from Canada that haven't worked overseas, they haven't thought of that part yet. So as a, a next kind of a question, we're wondering, first of all, Jacqueline, you're saying you believe that Hannah is a strong candidate and that's awesome to hear. What kind of options are there in your mind out there for certified teachers just out of their teaching program at their university who want to apply to international schools? Like just give our audience kind of a sense of the kind of schools that she could apply for if she decides to just take the leap. Yeah, I would say that. So first of all, you're thinking regional, you know, uh, what region would you want to teach in? And I would highly recommend keeping that wide open. Many candidates will say, I just want to teach in Europe. Well, of course you do. Everybody wants to teach in Europe. But the fact is, because Europe is so highly sought after, it hires very experienced teachers at the top of their game, at the perhaps even at the end of their career, then they can go to Europe. So the more you look at countries that you've never even heard of, I was hired at a country that I never heard of <laughs> in the Middle East. I had never heard of Oman before I got an email requesting an interview. I was like, where the heck is Oman? And had I not looked into that, I had the best seven years at that school. And it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. So keep your net wide and also interviewing for sure with any school to get that practice, to get sort of what are the questions they're asking. But then when it comes down to a decision time, if you're getting offers from schools, then, well, first of all, reach out to me so that I can help you make that decision because I've heard of a lot of schools. And if I haven't heard of it, it kind of sends off alarm bells. <laughs> but also, is it a for-profit? Is it a non-profit school? Is it a local school? Meaning, do local students go there to learn international curriculum? Or is it an international school in the sense that there's 55 nationalities in a classroom, you know, or, or in the school. So there's a lot of things to weigh. And fortunately, I started to think about this when I was creating my website. And I've written blogs and tips on how to determine what type of school you'd like to try and apply to. So Hannah, I would definitely recommend taking a couple of Saturdays, you know, to sort of peruse through my website and click on articles that seem to speak to you to help you make that decision. And, oh, I was going to mention also, because I do have this in an, a tab. So the first article that I would recommend that you read, Hannah, is where to find a position because there's three different ways. So you can get word of mouth and networking. So that's with LinkedIn. That's with, you know, my help. I can start giving you leads on jobs but then the second way is to target specific schools. Let's say, you know, you want to really return to Greece, but you want to try Athens. So then you might target Athens International School and look to see if they have a position. But the third way is recruitment agencies. And then on this article, I've listed a lot of the recruitment agencies that are out there and some are free. So that's what I would recommend you do is start filling out the application forms on these recruitment agencies, especially the free ones, and see what they have to say. They might come back to you and say, well, you know, you haven't got your two years yet. But in other cases, they might say, oh, yeah, you've got more than enough because of your student experience and your volunteer experience. So Jacqueline, you pretty much already answered this, but just wondering if there are any other next steps to think about or if you feel like you've covered everything. 
Yeah, I think researching, starting to think about where you'd like to go, and then getting your foot in that door with the different recruitment agencies, you know, the different school websites and looking at their career page or because sometimes it's a little bit like a detective work trying to find the job listings on a school website, but usually it's under employment or careers or join us. You know, it might be a little hyperlink that you can click and it says join us and then you can look at their job advertisements. The good news, Hannah, is because you are an elementary teacher, I would say that is the most frequent job listing. Almost all schools are always looking for an elementary position, but I think every school will have an elementary position available. And because we're in January, they've already started to fill their specialist positions. Now they're looking for elementary positions. So you're poised right at the right time to start applying for these elementary positions. She's got that gifted piece too. So that's helpful. Yeah, sure. absolutely. And I, I mean, there's just so much, Hannah, there's so much on your CV that is working in your favor. We didn't mention it in the podcast here, but the, you were in Jamaica for a little bit as well, working with missions there. And so you've got that international experience already, as opposed to someone that's straight out of university in the United States or Canada has never been overseas you can already speak to, well, I've lived overseas and I know a little bit about what it's like to live in a country that doesn't speak English as a first language. And so I think that is a good selling point for you. Well, and I would add to that the fact that she was willing to just jump in with this cost program and just, yep, I'm signing up. I don't know where I'm going, but she had the confidence to just say, I'm just going to do this. That speaks volumes too. That's the kind of thing that international schools are looking for is someone that's just ready for the adventure. Yes, I will agree with that. So Hannah, we're going to wrap up here. Are there any questions you have or anything else you'd like to say? I think my only question right now, as far as just starting to explore possibilities, would you recommend that I just start looking at specific schools or going through, as you said, some of these recruiting agencies and starting through that, what would be the best way just for me at the very beginning of this adventure, which path should I take as far as looking to see what is out there and what is available? I think it's less time consuming to go the route of a recruitment agency. I think if you start targeting schools, some of those schools are going to be those very top schools that have hundreds, if not thousands of applications for a position. If you know you have this fantasy or this, this dream of going to the American School of Paris, everybody has that dream, you know, and so it will be very difficult to get in and target that particular school. But if you sign up with some of these recruitment agencies, especially the ones that are free, then you'll start getting listings, you'll start getting job leads, and you can apply for those. And they might be at schools you've never heard of, they might be in countries you've never heard of. And that's kind of the exciting part is it opens up the world for you that you might not even know about. Yeah, absolutely. One of the actual benefits listed on the American School of Paris website when my husband was considering applying there is Duh, you get to live in Paris. <laughs> it was listed as a benefit on their site. I love it. All right. So Jacqueline, could you just please remind our listeners how they can follow you or reach out to you if they're interested in learning more about your consultancy, if they're preparing to recruit for overseas teaching positions and would like your guidance? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'd am i be really happy to talk with anyone who's presently a teacher or as in Hannah's position, just finishing up their degree and looking to move overseas and wants help and advice. They can go to my website. It's jpmintconsulting.com jp mint because my initials are jpm and int international and consulting so it's there's no dots there's no hyphens it's jpmintconsulting.com and on that website you'll find the services i offer you will also find a wealth of knowledge in blog articles and tips these tips are very short uh, little articles on what to specifically do on your CV, your cover letter, or how to find a job. And I've been posting them 
about once a week or once every couple of weeks. So there's, I think we're up to like 24 job search tips. So that's why I, Hannah, I was suggesting take a couple Saturdays, you know, peruse the wealth of knowledge that's there. And when you have questions, I'm just an email away. Well, this is where I get to say also consider looking at the Educators Going Global website because we have quite a few resources on there as well. We have a couple of more podcasts with Jacqueline on. We have one with uh, Greg Lemoyne who's talked about Finding the Right Fit, which is a helpful book as you go through the recruiting process. So also consider going to our website. Oh, we also have a lot of the recruitment agencies listed and things like that. So there are other things too. So I would say do both. (laughs) All right. Well, ladies, thank you both so much, Jacqueline, for your always informative expertise, your willingness to reach out and help people. You're very thorough. You're very knowledgeable. It's fabulous to have you on. And Hannah, for your courage in coming on as a brand new teacher and an aspiring international teacher. Thank you so much for your willingness to take this journey with us and to put yourself out there. I think you are going to have a long and wonderful international teaching career. So thank you both. First, Hannah, you are so incredible to open yourself up to this session and the recording of it. And now that we'll share it out with our followers Uh, Thank you so much for doing this. And as always, Jacqueline, you're such a pro. We keep learning all the time from you. And I'm super excited for the next episode when you're going to go over the cover letter with Hannah and all of our listeners. Thank you so much for inviting me. And Hannah, it was a pleasure to work with you. And I also look forward to our continued working relationship and getting you that job. If that's what you want to do this summer, let's, you know, let's look into that and let's uh, work together. Great. Yes. Well, thank you all for working with me. It's exciting to have found a community of international educators. I think a couple months ago, I was like, I want to do this thing, but I don't know anybody Uh who's done this before. So thank you for helping me and welcoming me into this. You are most welcome. Most welcome. Thank you for joining us today on Educators Going Global. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the other usual suspects. Please subscribe, like us, and leave a review on Apple and Spotify. And let your teaching friends know about us so we can grow our community. Please reach out at educatorsgoingglobal at gmail.com and join our Facebook group, Educators Going Global, if you have ideas, comments, or wish to share a Going Global story of your own. You can also find us on Instagram at Educators Going Global. Please visit our website as well, www.educatorsgoingglobal.com. All our podcast episodes are on there by topic, along with blog posts, Going Global stories, and our ever-growing resource library. For now, this is Audrey and David inviting you to travel, teach, and connect with us.